Christine Mundwa, who will join us just now, is a journalist who have worked already for CNBC Africa, Bloomberg, and nowadays for Deutsche Welle, the international German um, news outlet. So she will lead the panel that is all about infrastructure for connectivity. And again, please share your views on infrastructure, on connectivity in the chat function. There might be possibilities that, are, that your questions are taken and selected. So, Christine Mundua, are you with us? I am absolutely with you. Good morning to you. And thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Good morning to you too. Good morning also to the speakers on the panel. Christine, I will hand over to you now. I wish you all the best and a lot of success for this panel with the best outcomes for all of us. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And it is indeed in the spirit of partnership that we're having this conversation today. We are talking about digital connectivity. I don't know if you have ever just taken a few moments to think about how frustrating life in 2022 in the modern day era would be without the Internet. Right. It is it is the basis of our livelihood. It is how we communicate. It is how we collect and process data. Uh, it is how we travel. It is, it is how we make ourselves comfortable. It is how we make what would be very difficult procedures much, much easier. So just think about an existence without the internet. And I know that if you're, if you're hearing my voice today from whatever part of the world that you're in, you can really understand how crucial and how important uh, the internet is to our modern day existence. But in the very same breath, we find ourselves at a place in time where millions of people are not connected digitally. These people do not have access to this resource that really fuels and powers our modern day life. Many of them are in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I was shocked to learn that in 2021, yes, that is just last year, only 33% of people in Africa were able to use the internet. That just tells you how much of a gap that is existing in the continent. And indeed, Africa is really one of the, the worst affected regions when it comes to that digital divide. And in a modern time when we're talking about everything that we're trying to achieve together as a global community in terms of our sustainable development goals, you can see how that would exacerbate inequalities, socioeconomic equalities, when so many people are, are, do not have access to this crucial resource that is powering our modern day existence. But this also presents a grand opportunity for us. It presents an opportunity, especially at a time and in an era where Europe and Africa, these are partners that have a long standing relationship, a relationship that we continue to see evolve. Here comes a moment for us in the spirit of resetting our engagements. How can these two neighboring continents that share such a complex and special history how can we help each other bridge this divide? And so it is in that context, it is within that spirit that we're having this conversation today. I was talking to you about the digital divide. Um, and before I get into the conversation with my esteemed panelists, I'd like for you to have a listen to some voices, both from Europe and from Africa, um, talking to you about the places where they live and the relation that they have to the conversation of the digital divide. So let's have a listen to these voices and after which I will then introduce to you the panelists of the day and the conversation will get underway. Hola, uh, I'm Leila from Spain. As a team member of APC, I know how important affordable internet access is. I'm aware that the traditional business models are letting too many people behind, especially in Africa, so I would really like to see more support for local and community networks so that they can provide meaningful connectivity. Bravo. I'm Emiliano Moraza. As a citizen of Rwanda, I worried about education inequality in my country, and I think connectivity and open internet can help to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Thank you. Sani Bonani, I'm Nuben Togozo from Zimbabwe, currently working at Solus University. Internet connectivity is the pipeline of education and development, especially in Africa. Connectivity, even to the last mile, is what we need for development and sustainability. Thank you. 
Bonjour, mon nom est Huda Farah Kissous. My name, uh, good morning, my name is Huda Farah Kissous. I am an entrepreneur and I live in Marrakech. For the future, we all need to be connected to Internet and to have a minimum everywhere in Europe or in Africa in order to be able to realize our objectives, uh, to be able to have e-health, uh, e-government, everything that we can do through our smartphones. You heard it, ladies and gentlemen, the voices are of people speaking to us um, from both Europe and Africa, reiterating just the importance, how significant it would be if more people were digitally connected. I now want to introduce to you uh, the panelists of the day, the people that you will be hearing from. And as you will hear from the from their bios, their very short bios and their titles, um, they are working in, they are different, they're in the different stakeholder levels um, of this um, uh, exercise. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Toela Nirenda Jere, who is the Af from representing the African Union's Development Agency, NEPAD. Mr. Thierry Bob, he is from the European Commission's Director General for International Partnerships. Andrietta Esterhazen is uh, representing civil society organization. She is for the Association for Progressive Communications. Mr. Alessandro Gropelli is from the European Telecommunications Network Operators and Associations, that is, uh, private sector in Europe. Mr. Tabo Mashihwane is representing the Africa ICT Alliance, also represent, uh, representing private sector in Africa. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Hossam Algamal, representing the ICC Digital Economy Commission, also uh, an African voice uh, with us here today. I want to get right into the conversation. And Dr. Nirenda Jere, I would like to begin by asking you, what are the EU and the AU's investment priorities when it comes to digital connectivity? And how would this shape this renewed uh, engagement, this new partnership um, between Europe and Africa shape that? Um, thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon um, to the um, participants and to my fellow panelists as well. So I think in terms of the investment priorities um, and, and really coming out of the AU EU summit and some of the discussions that happened there, um, including some of the different initiatives that have emanated from that, the investment priorities I think are fairly similar and very common. I think it's also very clear in terms of um, the, the respective rules, I suppose, from the um, African side as well as the EU side. Um, connectivity still remains a challenge. Um, I think we, we, we understand, of course, that there have been significant improvements in terms of the submarine connectivity that connects Africa to the rest of the world, as well as the terrestrial connectivity between our capitals, um, you know, that, that helps us in terms of driving um, regional integration. But we also acknowledge that it's not enough, it's not sufficient, and, and that more still needs to be done. So clearly that is one area um, that um, will continue to be a priority. Uh, we need more connectivity, we need better connectivity, we need faster connectivity, and we need connectivity that helps us to reach, um, as, as one of the speakers in the video said, the last mile, you know, how do we get to those people that are still not able to enjoy the benefits of um, being digitally connected. The second um, issue, I think, in terms of investments, we'll have to, to really look at um, the ecosystem insofar as it supports um, MSMEs uh, and, and, and really being cognizant of the fact that um, in terms of intra-African trade and, and Africa's aspirations for regional integration, MSMEs uh, will be a significant um, actor in that space. They will need to be capacitated in terms of being able to fully participate in the economy. And I'm, I'm steering away from saying digital economy because I've been in meetings this week where the conversation has been that let's not say digital economy because the economy is what it is and, and internet and, and um, the use of digital technologies is an integral part of that. So we 
need to think about the fact that um, we should not separate um, and, and talk about a digital economy versus other things. My last point, I think, has to do with issues around industrialization um, and how we will use um, technology to facilitate industrialization, because that is also what will help us to create opportunities to create jobs. And then lastly, I would be remiss not to mention this, because I, as I sit here on the panel, and Riet and I are the only females, and a very stark um, uh, portrayal of, of the prevailing situation on the continent as well. There needs to be more inclusiveness. There needs to be more um, women that are being encouraged and supported and enabled to actually participate um, in terms of the use of um, ICTs and technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Toela, and, and really uh, for reiterating that point about inclusiveness um, in, in, in the plans uh, that, that we make. And, and I'd like to come to you, uh, Thierry, because I, I present to you the same question. Um, what would you say are the investment priorities from an EU perspective? Yeah, from an EU perspective, we, we are uh, addressing the overarching priority of boosting digital connectivity. This is essential in our partnership with Africa continent and Africa countries. And the launch of the Global Gateway for us is a turning point for scaling our investments. Our EU Commissioner, President van der Leyen, has announced it at the EU-AU Summit. We will mobilize a significant part of 150 billion in terms of his investment in connectivity in Africa for digital infrastructure projects. Digital connectivity for us is the foundation of building successful African digital economies. Sorry. Uh, and, and there is where we start. Our objectives are straightforward. We want to narrow the digital divide, promote a human-centric connectivity, I cannot but insist on this, and support our African partners in safeguarding their digital sovereignty. We will aim to balance our investment in hard infrastructure and soft elements. We are adopting a holistic approach and we are planning to intervene at multiple levels. International connectivity first. We will contribute to investment in major submarine cables to increase available international bandwidth in Africa. And the objective is really to increase the connections between our two continents for an overall resilience of our connections. But nonetheless, we will support investment in regional backbones to foster internet traffic within Africa and connect the missing links, particularly with, between countries. We will support data infrastructure and open internet for investment in secure and green and data cloud infrastructure. Our aim is really to foster data sovereignty and the open and secure and free internet at the same time. And last but not least, we will support last mile connectivity at country level in the many places where our partner, where partner demands has influenced our plans. The objective is to become Africa's closest partner on digital. And the global gateway for us is our offer to start a partnership that has the potential to transform the relation between the continents. Over to you. Thanks so much uh, for that, Thierry. And of course, you, you quoted a big sum of money there. Um, and I just want to remind our audience that, that the bit that we're talking about right now requires um, capital intensive investments. This is building the infrastructure that is needed uh, to be able to connect all those millions of people uh, that should be digitally connected. Um, I want to pivot to you now, Andrietta, from a civil society perspective. You've heard it from the sort of political level, um, but from where you sit, and I know you're sitting in South Africa, um, give us a sense of what, from your perspective as civil society, what should be the priorities in terms of where the investment um, is actually allocated? Um, thanks very much and greetings to everyone. Um, well, firstly, I, 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 I would endorse the, the comments from Terry and from Toela. Um, I think those are all important priorities. Um, I think I would make one overarching point that is slightly different, though, and that is that I think we need to invest not just in connectivity. I think ultimately the, the connectivity divide, you know, as Tuella was saying with regard to gender, is also a social divide, and it's a social and economic divide. And I think that's why the holistic approach 
of the gateway is significant. We need to invest in human capacity, in education, in good governance, um, not just in the connectivity infrastructure, but also in the human and institutional um, infrastructure. And um, openness is absolutely vital. And I think here we're talking about the open internet at multiple levels, at the levels of, of open protocols and interconnectivity between networks, and at the level of open markets and, and, and competition and, and creating enabling um, regulations for small scale and local and community based operators, but also openness at the level of content and, and respect for human rights and, and the internet as a driver for, for, for more um, um, exercise of rights and for more open government and more transparent government. But then to home in on, on the access issue, I think really we need to diversify access markets. We need policy and regulation that, that enables local connectivity enables the unconnected to connect themselves through small scale service provision through community networks that are owned and, and run by communities and, and this requires not just enabling policy and regulation and licensing environments but also financing and human capacity development um, so ultimately i think diversifying strategies is really important i think for too long we have placed all our connectivity uh, expectation on mobile data and expansion of mobile data. Um, and it has achieved enormous uh, increases in connectivity, but it also is exclusive because data is expensive and the devices that one needs to enable mobile internet and use it are also expensive. So um, I think um, you know, creative re regulation of spectrum is absolutely important and not just by making more spectrum available for the large operators, but also making spectrum and frequency available for, for wireless solutions at the local level. Um, I think finally, I would say that we, we also need to remove barriers, barriers such as taxing social media, barriers such as, as high tariffs on, on devices that people need to access the internet. So this holistic strategy at the level of policy and regulation and at the level of human capacity development and financing, I think can really make a big difference. I completely underline what Tawela said about the digital economy not being the only uh, or, or not creating artificial divisions between the economy as a whole and the digital economy. They fully integrated. And then institutions. We need institutions that can take the work forward of doing policy analysis, gathering evidence, monitoring and, and impact assessment. Um, and we need those institutions at the level of governments, civil society, business, technical community. Um, African institutions need to be a central part of growing um, the internet and internet connectivity in Africa. Back to you. Thanks so much uh, for that, uh, Henrietta. And just the reminder of where the focus has been uh, over the last few years, that, that emphasis on mobile data. And while that has achieved, uh, we've made lots of ground with that. It does have its limitations. Thank you so much uh, for that well-rounded approach from a civil uh, uh, society um, uh, perspective. I now want to pivot to the private sector, a crucial partner uh, in, 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 in business, so to say. And... Um, I want to come to you, Alessandro, um, from a private sector perspective, what should be the investment priorities as we try to bring more digital connection uh, to regions that are underserved? Thanks so much, Christine, and thank you to uh, the other panelists for the interesting viewpoints. Let me start by saying that I'm speaking to you on uh, uh, from the viewpoint of Etno that represent European telecom operators. As uh, you might know, there is uh, quite a lot of investment and presence from European telecom operators in Africa uh, across markets. Uh, so to start with, we look at Africa as an extremely exciting continent in terms of what is happening in the digital economy and in the digital society uh, at large. 
And the reason why we look at that with inspiration mostly, uh, also for our own innovation here at home, is that uh, uh, the continent is extremely young and is extremely creative. So we see a lot of reverse innovation uh, happening uh, as we uh, learn uh, from our experience uh, uh, in African markets. And we get new ideas on what we can make better also than here at home. Um, my first message is that we support uh, the Global Gateway. We think uh, that the principle on which the Global Gateway is uh, built are going to be good um, uh, also for business and they are going to help our relationship, our business relationship with the uh, uh, African markets. And the reason is that there are three very important principles in the Global Gateway that uh, are interacting with a lot of our business models and uh, policy priorities in Europe. The first one is the idea of a positive choice of a partnership rather than creating dependencies. These today in, uh, in uh, the global digital world is ever more important. You need to bring um, resilience to your network. You need to be independent uh, uh, to a certain extent on services and be uh, actually the owner of your own uh, uh, data. Uh, the second one is that the Global Gateway looks uh, at uh, uh, investment and digital investment from the viewpoint of the twin uh, digital and green uh, transitions. This is extremely important for us uh, and I'll explain you how I think that demand and supply can play into this, uh, into this aspect. And third, open internet and secure, resilient internet. Uh, the dramatic events happening uh, in Europe, in Ukraine, teach us even more how important it is to uh, support a decentralized model of internet that makes uh, the network resilient so that people can keep on communicating even uh, in uh, really hard times like the ones that uh, Ukrainians are living today. But let me now uh, quickly go at the telecom and infrastructure uh, angle uh, when looking at the discussions we are having uh, uh, today. Uh, the big distinction for us is between the so-called network layer and the service layer, the services that come on top of the network. And the two things go together. So you need a lot of investment ahead of demand at the infrastructure level, but then you also need services uptake. You need reasons for people to use those uh, uh, networks. And this is extremely important from our viewpoint. I was looking at the data from one of our biggest members, Orange uh, uh, Group. Today, one in 10 Africans use uh, their services. And Orange Group invests 1 billion euros a year, roughly, in, uh, in, in Africa. And that ranges. It is about coverage uh, in terms of territorial coverage of the networks, but it is also about the speed and the quality of those networks. And uh, it, will, it is also, as Thierry said before, about cables, both undersea cables and terrestrial cables. This is the side of the network, the network layer, but then there is the services that come on top. And if you look at the business model of telcos, and uh, I'm mentioning here again the example of Orange, it is not only about connectivity per se, but it's also about financial services. We know uh, excellent examples from Orange Money, to M-Pesa. The services are what drives the use of the network, but they are also active in energy, in education to Henriette's point, because we need to look at it from the ecosystem viewpoint. So let me wrap up uh, my initial uh, ideas uh, by telling you that the main challenge of any telecom operator in any part of the world is that you got to invest ahead of demand, which means that you need to put money on the table before the demand comes. So from a policy viewpoint, I think that one key chief way uh, to help 
the rollout of network and to speed up the rollout of network is looking at demand side measures and demand generation. And here I close it with the twin digital and green transition. The beauty of demand side policies is that they drive digital transformation in society well beyond the private sector and at the same time they help you to build a business model that from scratch are more sustainable across the board also from a climate viewpoint these are my main messages looking forward to hearing more from fellow speakers thanks so much uh for that um um, Alessandro and, and for again you know highlighting the demographics uh, of the African continent this is a place where more than 70 percent of the population is below the age of 35 um, and I can already foresee the kind of demand for services uh, with digital connectivity uh, that we have there. Tabo I'll come to you now also from a private to get a private sector's uh, perspective uh, an African private sector's perspective here. Uh, Tabo, what should be the investment priorities and, and, and from where you sit, how would they renew this partnership uh, between Europe and Africa? Thank you, uh, Chris, Christine, and uh, uh, good, good day to everybody uh, on the panel and all the listeners. Uh, I think uh, uh, the point of departure that we have to take is is the fact that uh, connectivity going forward is something that is supposed to be taken in the same light as as electricity, access to water, and 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 life itself. It is it is going to be something that has to be taken as a basic a requirement for one to live. And and while I I might want to touch on almost similar topics that my my uh, fellow panelists have have spoken about which touches on the issue of meaningful connectivity and affordability on the end end points uh, uh, devices uh, what is a more a critical without having to regurgitate what has been spoken about is the soft aspect so the soft aspects of having to 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 invest in education and training awareness on the general population uh, as well as uh, potential uh, technology partners that are local. Uh, it is imperative that uh, we, we, we have that outlook of, of having a capacity development. It is the view that uh, we've got that will ensure that there is sustainability from a perspective of creating demand and uh, creating the need and thus increasing utility uh, in the future should you have this particular uh, 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 connectivity being available. It also does not help to speak about investment at the end of the day that you find yourself having white elephants at the end of the day. What is very critical is that at the first point of call is that investment in ensuring that we have got this capacity and development and you also have uh, with regards to uh, skill sets themselves being laid out locally to have this particular uh, uh, thinking and also investments to be sustainable. It's, it's important that we start, we start there. And, 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 and secondly, what is also uh, critical, these are soft uh, issues, but that I think from an investment perspective, and they might actually predate the time when you are actually laying out the investment itself is also to align uh, with regards to policy and outcomes. It has to be. It is imperative that 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 happens uh, so that at the end of the day there is an equal footing in whatever partnership that happens uh, between uh, the continent. So uh, with uh, uh, Europe, and this is where, uh, in terms of. Um, our organizations such as ourselves, it's imperative that uh, we actually make sure that we facilitate that. And the reasoning uh, being that uh, at the end of the day, when one is putting uh, uh, down an investment, uh, this investment uh, makes sense. And it also, at the end of the day, uh, has got a, 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 a return to intended uh, outcomes uh, at, the, at the end of the day. 
And uh, there is another aspect when it comes to investment, which is uh, taking considerations of the limitations in which most uh, amongst us in Africa find ourselves, which are, are stemming from the past industrial revolutions. And these are issues such as uh, limitations on electricity and so And It is important that our investments uh, become uh, uh, such, such a way that we invest in technologies that are re renewable and that are, are friendly to, to, towards uh, 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 such limitations. Otherwise, uh, there is a, a challenge of having to uh, invest and put in a top of class type of investment and layout in, in Africa and only to find out that there is a, a such basic a, a challenges. And this is a, my view that the investments that a, have to be put in place have to be in such a way that they take all these limitations a, into, into, into place. A, what is also would be a, of importance is that while we are going to speak about a, this partnership that goes beyond Africa, a, it's imperative that a, intercontinental a, connectivity and, and, and challenges are things that we, 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 we start at before we, we, we can make, a, as an example, a connectivity between a, a, a Nigeria and, 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 and Britain to be a, accessible and cheap, it is imperative that that accessibility between a, Nigeria and Kenya or, or Ghana is actually a, a very sustainable and so. And, and it is a, with the basics, bread, bread and butter issues that a, if we start with, with them, and uh, investment becomes uh, very sustainable in the long haul if we start with, with, with these uh, items. I did not want to, to, to touch a lot on the issues that have already been uh, uh, spoken about, which is the issue of uh, connectivity and uh, issues of uh, devices and, and the likes. But I wanted to actually bring a different perspective with regards to the soft issues that uh, might have to be invested in, in ensuring that at the end of the day, uh, uh, we have a uh, sustainable uh, investment in, 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 in Africa. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, Tabo. You reminded us of the ambitions uh, about integration uh, that we know uh, are in Africa. This is a continent that seeks uh, to foster engagements within the continent more. We've seen it with the AFCTFA and, of course, that Digital connectivity between the countries, as you were highlighting, is very, very important. Thanks so much for that. Um, Hossam, you've been patiently waiting for your turn now. I now come to you with, with this from where you sit. Um, what should be the investment priorities? And, and how, can you speak to us about that in the context of this, this renewed partnership now between Europe uh, and Africa? Thank you very much, uh, Christine. It is a very uh, lucrative session and, um, well, from my point of view, I think that a lot of things has been covered already. Uh, from the videos we shared, uh, what was said from our colleague from Rwanda regarding the importance of education and opportunities, or from Zimbabwe about the education and the development aspects, or our colleague Farah from Morocco about the e-government, e-health and other things. And then, of course, what Tuala uh, highlighted regarding the industrialization part. And then, Henriette, about the different ecosystem points, uh, regulation, uh, capacity building, and all of that. And uh, Alessandro, when he spoke about, uh, uh, rightfully, the business needs and the demand. And this is the most critical and important part that really uh, would drive further uh, connectivity growth um, uh, in my opinion is that uh, with the introduction of uh, the industry for revolution during the last 10 years and then uh, what happened with the pandemic we really discovered the real demand that is driving the need for connectivity mm -hmm. whether connectivity in africa or connectivity between africa and europe as well yeah. Um, it is with connectivity that we are able to empower women uh, work. It is with connectivity that we are able to have sustainable development. 
that we are able to deliver education properly across the continent during the pandemic uh, uh, time. And it is very important to share, uh, and this is very important, to share best practices that took place <clears throat> during the pandemic last two years, the uh, countries that had uh, good connectivity uh, across their uh, uh, region were able to deliver e-education to their uh, uh, younger uh, students and not face uh, um, problem in delivering such education or losing a year. Uh, and it was really very important. Also financial inclusion. It is during the pandemic year, it was extremely difficult to be able to go to banks uh, to uh, exchange uh, uh, money, to go to stores. And with the e-commerce availability, it was much easier to conduct this and to continue to have an economic um, growth in each country. A lot of people where there was no good connectivity lost their jobs. When there was connectivity, there was really an opportunity to have a replacing job, either freelancing or doing e-commerce mm -hmm. or doing e-health or doing others. So the demand is very important and it was clearly identified during the last two years. Um, further to this, even the trade between Africa and Europe was quite affected during that period. And it is where whenever there was good connectivity, there was a good capacity to have a good supply chain integration and to, go, to have a good e-commerce as well. So in my, my opinion is that um, um, it is very important among other things to look at how we can move from uh, the traditional currently telecommunication regulatory authority into the digital transformation regulatory authority and to have more policies enabling uh, the need and the demand uh, delivery so that we really cater for investing in further connectivity while because when we under, the real problem during uh, the last 15 years in africa is that we were doing connectivity investment but we were not seeing the ROI on those investments. Mm -hmm. Now we understand. What we need to do is to share more uh, best practices, to understand further the successful stories that took place, and to be able to show the return on the investment mm -hmm. in such connectivity by providing enabling uh, policies uh, and sharing successful projects. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Hosan. You've reminded us about how the pandemic really revealed to us how important that digital divide um, is. I mean, I remember covering many a story about all the children who didn't have access to the internet and how learning from home was simply not a possibility for them. But in the same vein, we have accounts of somebody sitting in East Africa with a language ability and tutoring people in another region on the continent. So we can now see the potential in terms of that return of investment uh, that you're talking about or some. Hopefully now it is more evident to us as the pandemic has revealed to us how important it is uh, that we are all digitally connected. Toel, I'd like to come back to you here because I'm really still interested in this element of partnership here. Uh, we've heard from the African Union um, that it has a digital transformation strategy we're hearing from the Europeans, as we've heard from Thierry, that Europe wants to partner with Africa in that. How do you see Africa realizing its digital dream with the help of Europe? Um, thank you very much um, for that question. So I think one of the things to, to note, and, and Thierry, I think, was, was very clear in terms of um, the, the level of investment that the EU um, would like to make um, in, in improving the connectivity and, and the services across the continent. And, and the question we have to ask ourselves as Africans and in view of the, uh, the digital transmission strategy, 
are we ready to absorb that investment? You know, is our investment climate such that we will be able to actually um, leverage the, the EU um, investments into our um, ICT and other infrastructure and services? So we need to look at that very carefully and make sure um, that we are actually able to, to do that. Secondly, I think we, we have to also acknowledge the fact that um, while that investment is, is significant and, and indeed um, quite sizable, it perhaps will not meet or match all the needs um, in, in terms of that um, transformation strategy. So where will we get the domestic resources that will meet and complement the investments that uh, will come through um, from the EU? So we need as Africans to start thinking about how we will also be able to leverage domestic resources and invest those into um, our um, digital transformation strategy. The second thing I think that 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 um, perhaps is also worth mentioning is the fact that um, we have the digital transformation strategy. We have a number of other frameworks that are related um, to both the infrastructure development, um, to trade, to regional integration. So we have PIDA, which is the program for infrastructure development in Africa. We have the AFCFTA, which you have mentioned. Um, and we have other um, uh, strategies and frameworks across the continent. So it will be important, I think, in this um partnership with the EU and, and in view of the um, global um, gateway to make sure that there is that alignment between the existing frameworks and and this new um, initiative I think it would be um sad if we were um, found to be duplicating things that already exist or recreating um, things that we already have. So how will we make sure that we're building on what already exists and we are aligning um, with the uh, strategic frameworks that already exist across the continent? Uh, maybe uh, two other things that are worth um, talking about is, is uh, what um, I think uh, Nuriet and other speakers have alluded to about the multi-stakeholder um, aspect of how we will, um, um, you know, engage with the EU, but also amongst ourselves, making sure that nobody is left behind in terms of the conversations and the discussions, but also more importantly, in terms of the benefits. And then lastly, um, you know, we have to also acknowledge the fact that digital and ICT is, it doesn't exist on its own um, separate from other infrastructure. So it will also be very challenging if we accelerate on the quote unquote digital side, um, but we haven't taken care of other things like the energy sector, for instance, which is needed to drive our digital um, ecosystems. Um, and then the other attendant issues around transport, around access to, to water, um, education and so on. So I think the holistic approach is good and we have to make sure that uh, we are following an integrated approach. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for that, Toela. Really hearing you talking about shoring up uh, domestic resources to, to match uh, this investment that is being um, promised uh, at, at a European Union level. Um, thank you for, for, for that point and, and, and everything else there. Thierry, I do want to come to you now as well. Um, the Global Gateway, um, there's a lot of excitement um, around that, especially here uh, in Europe. Could you just give us a sense of how the European Commission um, intends to sort of implement the Global Gateway's guiding principles when it comes to digital connectivity projects and, and what kind of actions do you foresee to ensure this? Oh, thank you, Christine. First, I want to, to concur to every word Dr. Tuwela said, because we these are the challenges we, we are pretty conscious of and we, we really like to develop the partnership uh, with this regard. Uh, indeed, the Global Gateway is not without principle, and, and we have to ensure from the very beginning that we set up the projects in the correct way. I would like to highlight three principles. One is the green and clean uh, principle. As you know, digital technologies are keys, a key for the transition to a green economy. But ICT sustainability footprint is significant already. 5 to 9% of global energy consumption today and set to increase. And data center and, and networks are particularly uh, important in terms of energy consumption and green gas emission. This is why we need to promote the development of green digital and data infrastructure that to become a trademark of European connectivity project. 
We will support the construction of green or rather greener data center powered by renewable energy uh, this, to dispose of liquid cooling system and optimize waste heat reuse. We'll also promote smart submarine cables equipped with sensors able to monitor ocean data. The second principle we would like to, to highlight here is the security focus. We want to have to ensure that digital infrastructure are secure. Government, citizens and business have the need to, have need to find secure data. And security is a complex issue, obviously. It relates to physical equipment, to cybersecurity, and to regulation. All EU-supported infrastructure will be guided by the EU 5G cybersecurity toolbox, which is not only about 5G, but it is re really about cybersecurity. And it is applicable to all and to digital infrastructure. It provides guidelines, technical strategy, measures, and how to secure a network. Also, we will complement our infrastructure investment with soft measure, as usually, with support to cybersecurity capacity building and the drafting and enforcement of data protection legislation. The third principle I would like to highlight here, which is in line with what my predecessor said, it has to catalyze private sector investment. Indeed, our goals in the EU and in the African Union are ambitious. We will achieve them only in collaboration with the private sector. In fact, private sector primarily drives the expansion of digital connectivity. And we need to partner up and complement private sector investments where public funds are necessary, particularly where and when the market is slow to move in. We have world-leading companies in Europe with whom we can work. Private sector knowledge and investment capacity gives us a unique competitive advantage around the world. At the same time, the African telecommunication tech sector is vibrant. We seek to create new partnerships with African companies too. We have created the perfect platform with the Digital for Development Hub to create such new partnerships. The hub convening power is evident with this first multi-stakeholder forum. Over to you, Christine. Thank you so much uh, for that. And I'm looking at the clock and I'm getting a little bit nervous because I really want to spend more time with you. But uh, this is just a heads up uh, to, to the remaining speakers uh, about being judicious uh, with our time. I really wish we would have been uh, allocating more time to this conversation. I feel like we're just getting to the interesting part and we almost have to be rounding up. But Henrietta, I do want to come to you uh, now. and. Um, I just, I, I, you, you highlighted uh, the digital divided in your initial remarks. Um, and I, I wondered from you, if you could just speak to how, how, how you could design inclusive connectivity projects that take into account and adapt the local needs. Um, thanks, Christine. Um, I think you have to start by understanding those needs, really understanding what the specificity is of, of people's circumstances. I come from South Africa. We have the highest unemployment rate in the world. We have the, the biggest gap between rich and poor in the world. So introducing an ICT investment in an area where people don't have jobs or don't have any income has to factor that into account. So I think listen to people, understand the needs, um, reinforce existing local initiatives, strengthen um, 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 local actors, local institutions, um, and not just throw technology at social problems. Um, I think technology has an enabling power, but it has to be developed in and invested in, in, a, in a holistic way, as we've all been saying. You know, I think Alessandro talked about demand and supply, and I think that's the other thing. When you, when you invest in a, in a local initiative, understand the local demand and supply context. Um, is there electricity? Is it affordable? Um, how can the green energy component of the gateway be mobilized, not just to, to, to 
power ICT infrastructure, but to power people's lives, access to cooking, access to, to health. And then I think um, uh, the other issue is to look at control and ownership um, and, and have that uh, reinforced by your, your, your human capital development, by your financing incentives, and by your policy and regulation. I think just a final point here on demand side. I think demand side has to do with understanding what people's needs are, what content they need, and also what capacity um, they need beyond just the ICT infrastructure. So really looking at the complexity of the demand side um, and strengthening local ownership and control. And I, I know we're out of time, so I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Thanks so much for that. I think, but you really made the point that the investment should address the needs uh, of, of, of the community that it is being made in. Thanks so much for that. Alessandro, the business community is always talking about an enabling business environment. Right. And I just want you to talk to us a little bit about how um, this partnership between Africa and Europe, um, the money aside, just in terms of, I guess, the policy around creating an enabling business environment so that we see more investment going in uh, to particularly the underserved connectivity markets. Thanks so much, Christine. So on this one, first point, I think that having the global gateway from uh, European telecom viewpoint is good because this is a framework in which you know uh, you can go and invest and be safe and be in the context of a partnership that goes beyond your company. So uh, this is uh, to me the, the first and most important thing. Uh, the second one, when we look at policies in Africa, uh, there is a wealth of policy papers developed by uh, the telecom industry, by Etno, but also the GSMA colleagues. Spectrum is critical, and Riet mentioned it earlier in, in her intervention, in her opening intervention. Spectrum is basically the lifeblood of the mobile industry. So if you get the spectrum policies right, you can do a lot in helping the transition uh, to the faster generations of mobile internet. And here I want to uh, conclude by picking up two comments made by uh, colleagues here in the panel. Um, one is about the open internet and one is about uh, energy. Let me start from energy. Well, uh, the transition to the new generation of connectivity. I'm thinking of 5G, I'm thinking of fiber. These are critical to make uh, the net digital networks greener because we know that a full 5G network or a full fiber to the home network is uh, something that reduces the energy consumption of uh, 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 the use of internet, basically. And now, if I look at sub-Saharan Africa, we have uh, uh, figures for 5G that range from 0% to 6% in the best cases. So let's be aware that as we accompany the transition to new generations of networks, we also help those networks to become more energy efficient. Uh, the second thing uh, I mentioned is around uh, uh, the open internet. Again, colleagues mentioned it before, the importance of the multi-stakeholder model. As we build the networks in Africa, as we build an internet economy and society in Africa, let's also be together in those places like the ITU that are shaping the future of how internet will be governed. And let's stick together to the open internet principles, the decentralized model, the multi-stakeholder model, because that's what makes it resilient mm. and that's what allows you to be empowered as an internet user. Over to you, Christine. Thanks so much uh, for that, Alessandro. Tabo, I want to come to you now and I just want to pick up a point uh, that's been made by one of the uh, people who are joining us today, the viewers. Destiny is in Nigeria and is making the remark that the emphasis has really been on the urban centers. Uh, we're almost ignoring the rural areas. And so, Tabo, this really prompts my next question to you. Could you talk to us a little bit about the, the viable financing models that are applicable uh, particularly in the remote areas, the, the, the rural areas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Christine, uh, for that. I, I think uh, in terms of uh, viable uh, financial models, there is 
actually a, a couple of case studies that we already have uh, to, to see on how to actually uh, uh, do this to happen. Uh, an example of one case study is, is a case study which is a, a public partnership, a public-private partnership that uh, we have observed in one of the uh, municipalities uh, in, in South Africa, as an example, uh, it's funny, where you, you had a, a, a project uh, run by a company called Project Isiswe, uh, with in, in conjunction with the local municipality where what they do is that the project itself on the private uh, sector side uh, brings in the expertise as well as uh, uh, the, 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 the management of the project while uh, when you look at the aspect of uh, uh, the funding itself for, for, for that, uh, it came off from uh, the government, which is one of the models. However, there are other uh, case studies that we have also seen which uh, uh, leveraged from uh, corporate social investments, especially in the mining towns, where it's in a rural environment, there's only a mine, but what the, the mining towns have, have, have done was to actually, as part of their corporate social investment, to put in a, a, a infrastructure in, in schools, churches, uh, as well as other public in, uh, uh, spaces where uh, uh, the community itself can be able to access uh, this uh, uh, inter inter internet uh, with regards to uh, uh, them uh, having to uh, 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 internet access to, 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 to get to the services right. uh, that are there. Uh, 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 these are, are just some of, of the items, but I think we, we also have got others uh, that I just highlight on high level, which is a freemium type of an access where those who are affording can, can subsidize uh, uh, the rural areas. And we also have got another one, which is white listing, which has been followed mostly by, by the banks and uh, government uh, in environments where they actually make sure that you have got right. access to, to those critical services. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Sabu, and, and I was re really sorry to be rushing you on that front, uh, but we're down really to the last minute, uh, Hassam, and I'm really sorry to do this to you, but I, I would like for you to, let's stay on that on that aspect uh, of the rural areas as well versus the urban areas, but, but you just talked to us about the potential that we could be untapping if we make these investments, if we digitally connect people, not just in the urban areas of Africa, but also in the rural areas. Very quickly, Hassam. Okay, very quickly, while I need just to pick up on what Terry was saying, 5G, digital security, and green economy. So cybersecurity or digital security now with the Industry 4 introduction is extremely, extremely important. The more we go into transformation, digital transformation, whether in uh, rural areas or in cities, the more we need cybersecurity capability, um, capacity so capacity building cyber security and digital security is extremely important in OT and IT. 5G connectivity is uh, a game changer with the industry for uh, introduction whether in cities or in rural areas. Um, now we need also to think about low power when low power and connectivity is very 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 important for agriculture and for many other things and we need to look about the regulation about low power when uh, in uh, africa uh, uh, the more we use industry for now in fact we are able to uh, use uh, innovative solution with digital transformation to help in uh, digit, uh, in um, greener economy so let me just take by uh, among other transportation sharing um, so hailing um, uber style etc mm. this already minimize the footprint the co2 footprint so using digital technology properly will help minimizing the co2 footprint but also in many other we use that digital transformation technology in increasing preventive maintenance which again minimize uh, uh, loss of energy and use in factories. Now in rural areas, 
uh, agriculture enablement now using smart technology is extremely important. And there are many, many examples in Africa using smart technology for advising for uh, agriculture and many other, and is helping in e-commerce and financial inclusion right. in rural areas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you to those who've been listening to this conversation, to my speakers. Thank you for your insights. Uh, I know that your stakeholders at different levels in this conversation, uh, but the message I'm getting from this is this partnership between Europe and Africa is really going to help close this digital divide that exists uh, on the continent of my birth. It's the continent that I call home, and I'm really looking forward to the potential that is going to be untapped on that. Thank you so much for the efforts. Thank you for the comments, and to everybody who's joined us, your comments. We've seen them they've helped stimulate our conversation today uh, that does it from us thank you very much everybody appreciate your time bye bye thank you christine thank you to everybody thank you everybody bye bye Welcome back to the studio, everyone. Thank you, Christine, so much for moderating that panel. Thanks to all the speakers for sharing your views on connectivity. And as, we, as we've seen, connectivity is not only a technical issue, but also an economic and a social issue. So we really need to see how we can bridge the current gaps and how we can make the transition to a fair and inclusive digital economy as inclusive and also as green as possible.